Chapter thirty two of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter thirty two. Paris, June eighteen twenty one. Journey to Bretagne. Garrison of Dieppe. Return to Paris with Lucille and Julie. The whole of the preceding book was written at Berlin. I have returned to Paris for the baptism of the Duc de Bordeaux, and have given up my embassy from fidelity to the party of Monsieur de Villel, who has resigned. Having now leisure, let me write. In proportion as these memoirs grew from my past years, they represent to me the lower portion of an hour-glass, constituting the fallen sands of my life. When they have all run through, I would not turn my hour-glass, even if God had given me the power. The solitude to which I retired in Bretagne, after my presentation at court, was not like that of Combourg. It was neither so complete, nor so melancholy, nor, in a word, so compulsory. I might quit it if I liked, and it therefore lost its value. An old baron or baroness of many quarterings, keeping guard in their feudal manor over their only remaining daughter and son, afforded me what the English call characters. There was nothing provincial, nothing low in this way of life, because it was not that usually led where my sisters lived simplicity of manners still prevailed we went about dancing at each other's houses and having private theatricals at which i was occasionally an indifferent performer at fougere in winter we had to bear with the society of a little town its balls assemblies and dinners and i could not be overlooked as i was at paris on the other hand i had not been in the army and at the court without a change having taken place in my ideas in spite of my natural taste a something within me resisted my remaining in obscurity and called me from the shade julia detested the country the consciousness of beauty and talent urged lucile to a more extended field of action i felt in short so ill at ease in my mode of life that i became aware that it was never intended for me however i was always fond of the country and about marigny it was beautiful my regiment had changed its quarters the first battalion was in garrison at Havre the second at dieppe i rejoined the latter my presentation at court had made me quite a person of importance i took to my profession with spirit and attended parade regularly i had the charge of some recruits whom i drilled on the seashore that sea has formed the background of the picture in almost all the scenes of my life la martiniere did not occupy himself at dieppe either with his homonyme la martiniere or with p simon who wrote against bossuet port royal and the benedictines or with the anatomist Pequet, whom Madame de Sévigné calls Le Petit Pequet, but La Martinière was in love at Dieppe, as he had been at Cambrai. He was sighing at the feet of a stout cauchoise, with a headdress about three feet high. She was not young. By a singular coincidence, her name was Cauchy, the granddaughter, apparently, of that Dieppoise, Anne Cauchy, who, in 1645, was 150 years old. It was in 1647 that Anne of Austria, looking on the sea as i do from the windows of her chamber amused herself by watching the fire-ships burning for her diversion she left the young louis the fourteenth to the care of the people who had been faithful to henry the fourth and bestowed upon those people innumerable blessings notwithstanding their villainous norman dialect at dieppe we again meet with certain feudal services which i had seen paid at combourg to the citizen vauquelin were due three boar's heads each with an orange between its teeth and three coins of the most ancient money known i returned to pass a session at fougere in that town lived a noble lady named mademoiselle de la bellinay aunt of the countess of tronjoli of whom i have already spoken an agreeable but plain woman the sister of an officer in the regiment of conde attracted my regard i would not have been rash enough to raise my eyes to her beauty it was only when encouraged by the imperfections of a woman that i ventured upon offering my respectful homage madame de farcy who was a great sufferer at last came to the determination of leaving bretagne she persuaded lucile to accompany her and lucile in her turn overcame my repugnance to going we took the road to paris a sweet reunion of the three youngest birds of the covey my brother was married and lived with his father-in-law the president de rosambeau in the rue de bondy we agreed to settle near him and through the agency of monsieur de l'isle de salle who lived in the pavillon of saint lazare at the top of the faubourg saint denis we secured apartments in the same place. End of chapter 32
Chapter thirty three of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to eighteen hundred. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to eighteen hundred. By Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter thirty three. De Lille de Salle, Flin, Life of a Man of Letters. Paris, June, eighteen twenty one. Madame de Farcy had formed an acquaintance, I knew not how with de l'isle de salle who was formerly confined in vincennes for some philosophical nonsense in those days a man obtained celebrity for scribbling a few lines of prose or contributing a few stanzas to the almanac de muse de l'isle de salle was a good fellow of talents very decidedly mediocre with a great flow of spirits and one who bore his ears well the old man had a tolerably large library of his own works which he offered for sale to strangers and which no one in paris ever thought of reading every year in the spring he rubbed up his ideas in germany fat and portly he was in the habit of carrying about a roll of dirty paper which was to be seen sticking constantly out of his pocket to this paper he consigned the thoughts of the moment at the corners of the streets on the pedestal of his marble bust he had with his own hand traced an inscription borrowed from the bust of buffon god man nature he has explained all the lille de salle has explained all such specimens of vanity are very amusing but very discouraging who can flatter himself with being a man of true genius may we not all be as long as we exist under illusions similar to those of de l'isle de salle i would say that many an author who reads his phrase may believe himself to be a writer of genius when he is nothing but an ass if i have dwelt too long on the story of this worthy man of the pavillon of saint lazare it is because he was the first litterateur with whom i met and he introduced me to the society of others the presence of my two sisters rendered my sojourn in paris less insupportable and my inclination for study still more lessened my dislike de l'isle de salle seemed to me an eagle at his house i saw carbon flan des oliviers who fell in love with madame de farcy she amused herself at his expense he took the matter seriously for he piqued himself on being good company flan introduced me to fontaine his friend who became mine flan being the son of the overseer of the waters and park at Rheims, had received a very desultory education still he was a man of wit and now and then showed talents it was impossible to see an uglier man short and puffy with large projecting eyes bristly hair and foul teeth but notwithstanding all a man of by no means ignoble mien his mode of life a sample of that of almost all men of letters at that period in paris deserves to be related flan occupied chambers in the rue mazarine very near those of la Harpe, who lodged in the rue Guenigaud two savoyards travis did as lackeys in virtue of livery frock-coats waited on him they followed him in the evening and during the morning introduced his visitors at home flan went regularly to the theatre francais which was then at the odeon and especially distinguished for comedy brizard was just then closing his career talma commencing his larry saint phal fleury mollet d'azincourt du gazon grandmenil mesdames contat saint val desgarin olivier were all at the height of their reputation and mademoiselle mar the daughter of monvel coming forward to make her debut at the theatre montancier actresses were the patrons of authors and sometimes became the means of their success flan who had only a small allowance from his family lived upon credit on the approach of the parliamentary vacation he pawned the liveries of his savoyards his two watches his rings in linen and with the cash paid what he owed set out for rheims remained there three months returned to paris and with money received from his father redeemed his pleasures from the mont de piete began the circle of life afresh always merry and well received everywhere End of chapter thirty three chapter thirty four of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand, chapter thirty four. Paris, June eighteen twenty one. Men of Letters, Portraits. In the course of the two years which passed from my settlement in Paris till the opening of the Etat Generaux, my circle of society was enlarged. I knew by heart the elegies of the Chevalier de Pagny, and I know them still. I wrote to him to ask permission to visit a poet whose works were my delight. He replied politely, and I went to call on him in the Rue de Clery. I found a man still rather young, of good manners, tall and thin, and marked with the smallpox. He returned my visit. I presented him to my sisters. 
he had no great liking for society from which he was soon driven by politics he was then of the old party i never knew a writer who was more like his works being a poet and a creole all his wants were an indian sky a fountain a palm tree and a wife he dreaded noise sought to glide through life unperceived sacrificed everything to his indolence and was only drawn forth from obscurity by his pleasures which en passant awakened his lyre que notre vie heureuse et fortunée court en secret sous l'aile des amours comme un ruisseau qui murmurant à peine et dans son lit resserrant tous ses flots cherche avec soin l'ombre des abrisseaux et n'ose pas se montrer dans la plaine it was this impossibility of rousing himself from his indolence which turned the chevalier de parny from a furious aristocrat into a miserable revolutionist attacking a persecuted religion and its priests on the scaffold purchasing his repose at any price and lending to his muse which produced eleonora the language of the places in which camille desmoulins was in the habit of going to haggle about his amours the author of the histoire de la littérature italienne who crept into the revolution in the train of chamfort came to us in virtue of that cousinship which subsists among all bretons Ganguenet made his way in the world on the reputation of an agreeable piece of poetry la confession de zulme which procured him a paltry place in the office of m de necker from thence his piece gained him an entrance into the board of control i do not know who it was that disputed Ganguenet's title to the authorship of la confession de zulme but in fact it belonged to him the poet of rennes understood music well and composed it himself humble as he was we saw his pride increase just in proportion as he attached himself to some well-known man about the time of the meeting of the etat general chamfort employed him to draw up coarse articles for the newspapers and speeches for the clubs he became arrogant at the first federation he said what a magnificent fete to give it more splendour for aristocrats ought to be burned at the four corners of the altar he was not the first who had given utterance to such wishes long before him louis d'orleans of the league had said in his banquet du comte d'arrette that protestant ministers instead of faggots should be bound to the tree burned in honour of st john and henry the fourth put in the barrel where people put the caps ganguenet had some previous knowledge of the revolutionary murders madame ganguenet forewarned my sisters and my wife of the massacre about to be perpetrated at the calme and gave them an asylum they remained in cul de sac ferou close to the place where they were to have been murdered subsequently to the reign of terror ganguenet became quasi minister of public instruction it was then that he celebrated l'arbre de liberté at the cadran bleu to the tune of je l'ai planté je l'ai vu naître he was considered by his philosophy well qualified to be an ambassador to one of those kings who was about to be dethroned from turin he wrote to m de talleyrand that he had overcome a prejudice in his pride he had caused his wife to be received at court from mediocrity he started into importance from importance fell into silliness and from silliness into ridicule ending his days as a distinguished literary critic and which is still better as an independent writer in the decade nature restored him to his place from which society had unseasonably drawn him his knowledge is second-hand his prose heavy his poetry correct and sometimes agreeable the poet lebrun was a friend of ganguenet's ganguenet protected lebrun as a man of talent who knows the world protects the simplicity of a man of genius lebrun in his turn shed his lustre upon the elevation of ganguenet nothing could be more amusing than the characters played by these two friends by an agreeable intercourse rendering each other all those services which can be rendered by two superior men in different ways lebrun was just a mock gentleman of the empire his inspiration was as cold as his transports were icy the whole furniture of his parnassus an attic in the rue montmartre consisted of books lying pell-mell on the floor a mean bed with two dirty towels for curtains hung upon a rusty iron curtain-rod and a broken water-jug propped up against a bottomless chair it was not that lebrun might not have been at his ease but he was avaricious and addicted to bad company at the suppers à l'antique given by m de vaudreuil he played the part of pindar among his lyric pieces there are stanzas both energetic and elegant as in his ode on the ship le vengeur and that upon the environ de paris his elegies were the productions of his head rarely of his heart he had the originality of refinement not of nature he created nothing except by the power of art he wearied himself in perverting the sense of words and throwing them into monstrous combinations lebrun had a real talent for satire alone 
his letter upon la bonne et la mauvaise plaisanterie has enjoyed a deserved reputation some of his epigrams may be placed beside those of j b rousseau la harpe above all inspired him justice must be done him in another respect he was independent under bonaparte and he has left some cutting verses written against the oppressor of our liberties but undoubtedly the most bilious literary man with whom i was acquainted at that time in paris was chamfort affected by the malady which made jacobins he could never pardon men the accident of birth he betrayed the confidence of those into whose houses he was admitted he mistook his cynical language for a description of the manners of the court no one can deny him wit and talents but of that kind which never reached posterity when he saw that nothing was to be gained under the revolution he turned against himself the hands which he had lifted against society the red cap appeared to him in his pride merely another kind of crown and sans a species of nobility of which the marat and the robespierres constituted the high grandees furious at finding inequalities still existing among men in this world of sorrow and tears and condemned to be nothing more than a vilain under the feudal reign of executioners he tried to kill himself in order to escape from the magnates of crime his attempt failed death laughs at those who summon it and who confound it with annihilation i did not become acquainted with the abbe de lille till we met in london in seventeen ninety eight and i never saw rouliere who lived with madame d'egmont and maintained her nor palisot nor beaumarchais nor marmontel there was also de chenier whom i never saw who has attacked me severely to whom i made no reply and whose place in the institute was to produce one of the crises of my life on reading over most of the writers of the eighteenth century i am surprised both with the noise which they have made and at my own former admiration of their works whether it is that our language has advanced or retrograded whether we have been making progress towards civilization or retreating towards barbarism certain it is that the authors which formed the delights of my youth now appear to me worn out gone by lifeless and cold even in the greatest writers of the voltairian age i find poverty of sentiments of thought and of style to whom can i attribute my mistake i am afraid i must be regarded as the first criminal born an innovator i may perhaps communicate to new generations the malady with which i have been attacked frightened i cry in vain to my children do not forget french they answer as the limousin did to pantagruel qui vient de l'âme un clit et célèbre académie que l'on vocite lutesse this manner of greekizing and latinizing our language is by no means new rabelais cured it it reappeared in ronsard boileau attacked it in our days it has been resuscitated by science our revolutionists great greeks by nature have forced our tradespeople and peasants to learn hectare hectolitre kilometre millimetre decagram politics have been ronsardized i might have spoken here of monsieur de la harpe whom i knew at this time and to whom i shall return i might have added to the gallery of my portraits that of fontaine but although my connection with that excellent man commenced in seventeen eighty nine it was only in england that i formed a friendship with him which became always closer in misfortune and never relaxed in prosperity i will at a later period give the full effusions of my heart on this subject i shall only have to describe talents which no longer console the earth the death of my friend took place at the moment when my recollections were leading me to retrace the commencement of his life life passes so rapidly away that unless in the evening we record the events of the morning labours press upon us and we have no longer time to put them on paper this however does not prevent us from squandering away our years and from casting to the winds those hours which are to mend the seeds of eternity End of chapter 34chapter thirty five of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter thirty five paris june eighteen twenty one the rosambo family monsieur de Malesherbes, his predilection for lucile apparition and change of my suffide whilst my inclination and that of my two sisters had thrown me into this literary society our position obliged us to frequent another circle the family of my brother's wife was naturally for us the centre of the latter the president le pelletier de rosambeau who afterward suffered death with such distinguished courage was when i arrived in paris a model of fickleness at this time everything was deranged both the mental and the moral world symptoms of an approaching revolution 
the magistrates blushed to wear their robes and turned into ridicule the gravity of their fathers the lamoignon the mole the seguier the dagso wanted to fight and no longer to deliberate the ladies of the presidents abandoning the character of venerable mothers of families issued from their quiet houses to appear as brilliant women of fashion the priest in his pulpit avoided the name of jesus christ and only spoke of the christian legislator the ministers abused each other and power slipped through their fingers it was the fashion to be an american in the city an englishman at court a prussian in the camp to be everything but a frenchman all that was said and done formed but one tissue of inconsistencies they pretended to have a respect for the endowed clergy but would have no religion none but men of gentle blood could act as officers yet they arrayed themselves against their nobility they introduced equality into the drawing-rooms but cudgelling into the camps m de Marzeb had three daughters mesdames de rosambeau d'aunay and de montboissier he was most attached to madame de rosambeau in consequence of the agreement of her opinions with his own the president de rosambeau had likewise three daughters mesdames de chateaubriand d'aunay and de tocqueville and one son whose brilliant talents were adorned with christian goodness m de Marzeb enjoyed himself in the midst of his children his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren i have frequently seen him during the early times of the revolution arrive at the house of madame de rosambeau worried by politics cast aside his wig throw himself upon the carpet of my sister-in-law's room and begin romping and making a frightful uproar with the assembled children in other respects he would have been a man of ordinary manners were it not for a degree of decisiveness which prevented him from being regarded as such at the first sentence which issued from his mouth one perceived that he was a man of ancient name and a distinguished magistrate his natural good qualities were slightly spoiled by affectation in consequence of the philosophy in which he indulged he was full of wisdom of honour and of courage but hot-headed and passionate to a degree of which he himself informed me when speaking of condorcet that man was once my friend now i should have no more scruple about killing him than a dog he was wrecked by the waves of the revolution and his death established his glory the merits of this great man would have remained concealed had not misfortune displayed them to the world a noble venetian lost his life in endeavouring to save his rights in the fall of an old palace the frankness of m de Marzeb relieved me from all constraint he afforded me some instruction by this we were first rendered intimate we spoke of botany and geography which were his favourite subjects for conversation it was whilst conversing with him that i conceived the idea of making a journey in north america to discover the sea seen by herne and subsequently by mackenzie we discussed politics also the generous sentiments which gave rise to our first disturbances promoted the independence of my character the natural dislike which i entertained to the court added strength to this inclination i was on the side of m de Marzeb and madame de rosambeau against m de rosambeau and my brother to whom we gave the nickname of the irritable chateaubriand the revolution would have gained a support in me had it not been commenced by crime i saw the first head carried on a pike and shrank back murder can never appear in my eyes either an object of admiration or a proof of liberty i know nothing more base more despicable more cowardly or more mean than a terrorist have i not met in france with all that race of brutuses in the service of caesar and his policy the levellers regenerators and executioners were transformed into valets spies sycophants and still more wonderful into dukes counts and barons what a moderate age finally it was his liking for my sister that increased my attachment for this noble old man notwithstanding the timidity of the countess lucile she was prevailed upon with the aid of a little champagne to take a part in a little piece on the occasion of m de malesherbes birthday she appeared so amiable that she quite turned the head of the good and great man he exerted himself even more than my brother to procure her transference from argentier to remiremont for which a strict proof of sixteen quarterings was required philosopher as he was m de malesherbes held the privileges of birth in high regard we must consider this picture of men and of society at the time of my entrance into the world as applying to a period of about two years from the dissolution of the first assembly of notables on the twenty fifth of may seventeen eighty seven to the opening of the states general on the fifth of may seventeen eighty nine during these two years my sisters and i neither dwelt constantly in paris nor when there in the same part of it i must now retrace my steps and take my readers back to brittany i was still devoted to my fancies if the woods failed me pastimes instead of distant places afforded me another kind of solitude in the old parts of paris under the arches of st germain des prés in the cloisters of the convents in the vaults of st denis in the sainte chapelle in notre dame 
in the narrow streets of the city, at the obscure gates of Eloise, I still saw my enchantress, but she, under the Gothic arches and among the tombs, had assumed a something death-like. She was pale and regarded me with watery eyes. She was the mere shade or phantom of that dream which I had loved. End of chapter 35 End of part 1「First Political Movements in Brittany Brief View of the History of the Monarchy My political education was begun by my residence at different times in Brittany, during the years 1787 and 1788. The states of this province furnished the model of the states-general, and the particular troubles which broke out in the two provinces of Brittany and Dauphiny were the forerunners of those of the nation at large. The change which had been developing itself for two hundred years was then reaching its limits. France having passed from a feudal monarchy to the monarchy of the States-General, from the monarchy of the States-General to that of the Parliaments, and from the monarchy of the Parliaments to absolute monarchy, was rapidly tending to a representative system by means of a contest of the magistracy with the royal power. The Mopo Parliament, the institution of provincial assemblies, with the right of individuals voting, the first and second assemblies of notables, the corps plenière, the formation of large bailiwicks, the admission of Protestants to the full enjoyment of civil rights, the partial abolition of the torture and statute labour, and an equal partition of the burthens of taxation, were successive proofs of the revolution which was in progress. The whole of these facts, however, were not seen at once. Each event appeared like an isolated accident. There exists a spirit of the times in every historical period. By looking at events from only a single point of view, we overlook the rays which are converging from other points to a common centre. We do not go back to the concealed agent, which gives life and general movement, as water or fire to machinery. For this reason, it has often been supposed, on the breaking out of revolutions, that it would be sufficient to break a single wheel, in order to prevent the torrent from wasting, or the exploding of the steam. The eighteenth century, which was an age of intellectual rather than of material action, would not have succeeded in effecting so speedy a change of the laws and social institutions, had it not found the proper vehicle in the parliaments, and especially in the parliament of Paris. These became the instruments of the philosophical system. Every opinion dies either powerless or mad, unless it has found a habitation in an assembly which gives it power, strengthens it with a will, and furnishes a tongue and arms. Thus revolutions always have arisen, and always will arise from bodies legal or illegal. The parliaments had their cause to avenge. Absolute monarchy had wrested from them a usurped authority over the states-general. Forced registrations, beds of justice, and exiles, by rendering the magistrates popular, drove them to seek for liberties to which at heart they were not sincere friends. They demanded the states-general, not daring to avow that they were only aiming at legislative and political power for themselves, in this way they hastened on the resurrection of a body, the inheritance of which they themselves had obtained, and which, by its resuscitation, would immediately reduce them to their own special functions, the administration of justice. Men almost always deceive themselves as to their own interest, whether they are stimulated by wisdom or passion. Louis the Sixteenth re-established parliaments, which compelled him to appeal to the States-General. The States-General, transformed into a national assembly, and speedily into a convention, destroyed both the throne and the parliaments, by condemning to death the judges and the monarch from whom justice emanated. But Louis the Sixteenth and the parliaments pursued this course because, without their knowledge, they were the instruments of a social revolution. The idea of the States-General was then in every one's head, only they had no notion to what this idea led. The question with the multitude was to increase a deficit, which the humblest banker of the present day would undertake wholly to remove. A remedy so violent applied to an evil so slight is a clear proof that the people were being carried on towards unknown political regions. In the year 1786, the only one in which the financial condition of the state was already proved, the receipts amounted to 
nine hundred and twenty four thousand livres the expenditure to five hundred and ninety three million five hundred and forty two thousand deficit a hundred and eighty million six hundred and eighteen thousand reduced to a hundred and forty million by forty million six hundred and eighteen thousand savings in this budget the king's household is given at the enormous sum of thirty seven million two hundred thousand livres the debts contracted by the princes the purchase of chateaux and the depredations of the court were the causes of this excess it was intended that the states-general should assume the same form as in sixteen fourteen historians always refer to that form as if states-general had never been heard of or the assembling demanded since sixteen fourteen in sixteen fifty one however the orders of the nobility and clergy assembled in paris called for a meeting of the estates and there still exists a large collection of the records of acts done and speeches delivered on that occasion the parliament of paris at the height of its power at that period were so far from seconding the wishes of the nobility and clergy that they dissolved the assembly as illegal which it was and since i am on this subject i am desirous of remarking another important fact which has escaped the notice of those who have undertaken to write the history of france without a proper knowledge of it they continually speak of three orders as essential to the constitution of the states-general now it frequently happened that bailiwicks appointed deputies merely for one or two orders in sixteen fourteen the bailiwick of amboise did not send representatives either for the clergy or the nobility the bailiwick of chateau neuf en timere did not send representatives either for the clergy or the tiers etat puy la rochelle lauraguet calais chatellerault omitted the clergy and montdidier and roi the nobles notwithstanding this the assembly of sixteen fourteen was called the states-general the ancient chronicles stating the matter more correctly when speaking of our national assemblies either say the three estates or the bourgeois notables or the barons and bishops according to the circumstances and attribute to all those assemblies so composed the same legislative power it happened in all the different provinces that the tiers though possessing the right of being represented and being summoned did not use their privilege for a reason not always observed but very natural the tiers had got complete possession of the magistracy and driven out the military it reigned with absolute power except in some parliaments of nobles as judges lawyers registrars clerks etc it made the civil and criminal laws and by the aid of parliamentary usurpation it gained the privileges even of political power the fortunes honour and lives of the citizens hung upon its decision all yielded obedience to its decrees every head fell under the sword of its judgments when therefore it was already in the possession of unlimited power what need was there to go and seek for a useless portion of that power in assemblies where it only presented itself upon its knees the people metamorphosed into monks had taken refuge in convents and governed society by the influence of religious opinion then people metamorphosed into tax-gatherers and bankers had taken refuge in finance and governed society by money the people metamorphosed into magistrates had taken refuge in the courts and governed society by law the great kingdom of france aristocratic in its districts or its provinces was democratic as a whole under the direction of its king with whom it maintained an admirable understanding and preserved an almost uniform accord this fact explains its long existence a completely new history of france is still to be written or rather the history of france has never yet been written all the great questions referred to below were particularly agitated in the years seventeen eighty six to eighty seven and eighty eight the heads of my fellow-countrymen found abundant materials of excitement in their natural vivacity in the privileges of the province of the clergy and the nobility and in the collision of the parliament and the estates m de calonne who was for a very short time intendant of brittany had increased these divisions by favouring the cause of the tiers etat m de montmorin and m de thiard were governors too feeble to give predominance to the court party the nobility coalesced with a parliament which was noble one while it resisted m necker m de calonne and the archbishop of Sens, at another it repressed the popular movement which its first resistance had favoured it assembled deliberated protested the commune or municipalities met deliberated and protested in an opposite sense the particular question of hearth money by being mixed up with general questions increased animosities and in order to explain this it is necessary to explain the constitution of the duchy of brittany End of chapter one
Chapter two of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter two. Paris, September eighteen twenty one. Constitution of the Estates of Brittany. Sittings of the Estates. The estates of Brittany have undergone more or less changes, like all the estates of feudal Europe, which they resembled. The kings of France entered into all the rights of the dukes of Brittany. The marriage contract of Anne, Duchess of the Province, in 1491, not only brought Brittany as a dower to the crown of Charles VIII and Louis XII, but it contained stipulations by virtue of which a difference was terminated which reached as far back as Charles of Blois and the Comte de Montfort. Brittany claimed the right of succession for daughters, whilst France maintained that it was limited to the male line, and that on failure of heirs male, the duchy reverted as a fief to the crown. Charles the Eighth and Anne, and then Anne and Louis the Twelfth, made mutual concessions of their rights and pretensions. Claude, the daughter of Anne and Louis the Twelfth, who became the wife of Francis I, on her death bequeathed the duchy of Brittany to her husband. On the petition of the estates assembled at Vin, Francis I, by an edict published at Nantes in 1532, united the Duchy of Brittany to the Crown of France, giving guarantees to the former for the preservation of its liberties and privileges. At this period the Estates of Brittany assembled every year, but in 1630 their meeting became biennial. The opening of the Estates was announced by the Governor. The three orders met, according to the place, in a church or in the halls of a convent. Each order deliberated apart. They constituted three distinct assemblies with their different tempests, which were converted into a general hurricane when the clergy, the nobles, and the tiers met together. The court blew the discord, and in this narrow field, as in a larger arena, vanity, ambition, and talent were all called into action. Father Grégoire de Rostrenon, a Capuchin, in the dedication of his Dictionnaire Francais Breton, speaks in the following fashion to one of the estates of Brittany. If it demanded all the powers of the Roman orator to speak in just commendation of the august senate of Rome, was I justified in attempting to pronounce a eulogy upon your august assembly which presents to us a worthy idea of all that was honourable and majestic in ancient or modern rome rostrana alleges that the celtic was one of the primitive languages which was brought to europe by gomer the eldest son of japhet and that the barbretons notwithstanding their stature were the descendants of the giants of those days unfortunately the breton sons of gomer long separated from france have suffered a part of their ancient titles to perish their charters to which they did not attach sufficiently great importance as the bond which connects them with general history are often deficient in that authenticity whose value the decipherers of documents on their part exaggerate the session of the estates of brittany was a time of amusement and balls dinners were given by the commandant by the president of the nobility the president of the clergy the treasurer of the estates and the president of the parliament dinners everywhere with no lack of drinking there might be seen seated at the long tables of the refectory the labourers of du Gesclin and the sailors of duguay chouin wearing at their side the iron sword of the old guard or their boarding cutlasses the gentlemen who were present at the estates in person formed no bad resemblance of a polish diet of poland on foot not on horseback a scythian but not a sarmatian diet unfortunately too much time was given up to amusements there was no cessation of balls the bretons are remarkable for their dances and the tunes to which they dance madame de sevigne has compared our political banquetings in the midst of our lands to the festivities of witches and fairies which take place by night on the heaths you will now have she writes news of our estates as a punishment for being a breton m de chaun arrived on sunday evening and on monday morning he wrote me a letter to which i sent him in answer that i would go and dine with him there were two tables in the same room with covers for fourteen at each monsieur presided at one and his lady at the other good cheer was excessive and whole dishes of meats were carried away untouched and as for the pyramids of fruit it was necessary to raise the height of the doors our fathers did not anticipate such kinds of machines because they had no idea that it was necessary a door should be higher than themselves after dinner messieurs de la maria and crete logon danced minuets and extraordinary jigs with two breton ladies with an air which courtiers might have envied they performed bohemian and breton dances with an elegance and precision quite captivating night and day there was a constant round of amusement feasting and freedom which attracted everybody i had never seen the estates it is really a very pretty thing 
I do not believe that there is any provincial assembly which exhibits so great an air as this. It must be very full at least, for there is not a single person either with the army or at the court. There is no one except the little ensign, Monsieur de Sévigné, her son, who perhaps will return some day like the rest. An infinity of gifts, pensions, repairs of the highways and towns, fifteen or twenty great tables, constant gambling and never-ending balls, plays three times a week, and vast finery. Such are the estates, not forgetting the three or four hundred pipes of wine which are drunk. The Bretons can scarcely pardon Madame de Sévigné for her raillery. I am less severe, but I do not like to hear her say, You speak to me very pleasantly of our miseries. We are no longer so roué. One in eight days is entirely given up to the affairs of justice. It is true that hanging appears to me now a refreshment. This is pushing the easy language of courts too far. Barre spoke in the same style of the guillotine. In 1793 the Noyade of Nantes were called Republican marriages. Popular despotism reproduced the amenity of style used by royal despotism. The coxcombs of Paris, who accompanied the royal commissioners, stated that our country squires caused us to double up our tin pockets in order to carry home the commandant's fricasseed chickens to our wives. These sometimes proved very costly. A certain Count Sabran was not long since left dead in the square, in exchange for one of those unreasonable pleasantries. This descendant of the troubadours and Provencal kings, as tall as a Swiss, was killed by a little sportsman of Morbihan, not bigger than a Laplander. This cur did not yield to his adversary in genealogy. If St. Elzea de Sabran was a near relation of St. Louis, St. Corentin, grand-uncle of the very noble cur, was bishop of Campere, in the reign of Gallo the second, three centuries before Christ. King's revenue in Brittany, particular income of the province, hearth money, present for the first time at a political meeting scene. The King's revenue from Brittany consisted of benevolences, variable in amount according to circumstances, of the produce of the royal domains, which might be estimated at from 300,000 to 400,000 francs, and of the duties on stamps, etc., the province enjoyed its own special revenue to meet the charges of its administration. The great and small dues, which affected liquids and their transport, furnished two million annually, and lastly sums derived from the hearth tax. There is no doubt concerning the importance of the hearth tax in our history. It played the same part in the French Revolution, which the stamp duty did in that of the United States. The hearth money, the census pro singulis focus exactus, was a tax of so much for every fire laid upon the rich commoners and by the gradual augmentation of this tax the debts of the province were discharged in the time of war the expenses rose to more than seven millions from one session to another a sum which exceeded the receipts a scheme was proposed for creating a capital from the proceeds of the hearth money and consolidating it in stock for the benefit of those liable to the tax the tax then would have been merely a loan the injustice consisted in imposing it upon the property of commoners alone the communes never ceased to protest the nobles who laid less stress upon their money than their privileges would not listen to the proposal of any impost which should render them liable to taxation such was the state of the question when the bloody estates of brittany met in the month of december seventeen eighty eight men's minds were at that time agitated by various things the assembly of the notables territorial taxation trade in corn the approaching sitting of the states-general and the affair of the necklace the corps plenier and the mariage de figaro the great bailiwicks and cagliostro and mesmer with a thousand other important and silly questions were the objects of controversy in every family the breton nobility by its own authority had been summoned to meet at rennes in order to protest against the establishment of the corps plenier i attended that diet and it was the first political assembly at which i was ever present i was astounded and amused by the clamour some mounted on tables and armchairs others gesticulated and there was a general effort to speak all at the same time the marquis de tremagat with his wooden leg shouted in a stentorian voice come let us go to the residence of monsieur de Thiard, the commandant we will announce to him that the nobles of brittany are at his door they demand an audience the king himself would not refuse this piece of eloquence was received with bravos which made the ceiling re-echo he went on the king himself would not refuse it the huzzas and applause were redoubled we accordingly proceeded to the house of Monsieur de Thiard, who was a courtier, a writer of amatory verses, a man of gentle but frivolous mind, and mortally annoyed at our uproar. He looked at us as if we were owls, wild boars, or savage beasts. He longed to get away from our armorica, and had no desire to refuse us admission into his hotel. 
the speaker informed him of our wishes after which we reduced the following declaration to writing we declare all those infamous who accept any places in the new administration of justice or in the administration of the estates not sanctioned by the established usages and laws of brittany twelve members were chosen to lay this document before the king on their arrival in paris they were clapped into the bastille from which they were soon delivered as heroes on their return they were received with rejoicings and crowned with laurels we wore large mother-of-pearl buttons on our ermined coats with the inscription death before dishonour we triumphed over the court over whom everybody triumphed and we fell with it into the same abyss End of chapter two chapter three of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter three paris october eighteen twenty one my mother's retirement at st malo it was at this time that my brother ever intent on his own plans determined to have me admitted into the maltese order in order to accomplish this it was first of all necessary that i should enter the priesthood this i could do by the aid of m courtois de pressigny the bishop of st malo i went therefore to my native town to which my excellent mother had retired she no longer had her children around her and spent all her days at church and her evenings in knitting her absence of mind was inconceivable i met her one morning in the street carrying under her arm one of her slippers instead of her prayer-book from time to time some old friends found her out and they talked together about the good old times when she and i were alone she used to improvise to me some little stories in one of these the devil flies away with a chimney and a miscreant and the poet cries out le diable en l'avenue chemine ton et ton quand on perdit la vue en moins d'une heure de temps it seems said i that the devil does not move very quickly but madame de chateaubriand proved to me that i understood nothing about it my mother was really quite entertaining she composed a long lamentation upon le récit véritable d'une canne sauvage en la vie de montfort la canne les saint malo a certain seigneur had shut up a young lady of great beauty in the castle of montfort with a bad design through one of the windows she could see the church of st nicholas and on praying to the saint with eyes full of tears she was miraculously conveyed out of the castle but fell into the hands of some of the servants of the villain the poor young lady quite distracted looked around for help but could see no living thing except some wild ducks upon the pond of the castle renewing her prayers to st nicholas she earnestly besought him to permit these birds to testify her innocence so that if she should die without being able to fulfil her vows to the saint they might do so after their fashion in her name and for her benefit within the year the young lady died when lo on the removal of the bones of st nicholas on the ninth of may a wild duck followed by her ducklings appeared at the church dedicated to the saint she entered it and fluttered her wings in front of the image of the blessed deliverer to praise him by that action after which she returned to the pond having left behind one of her young ones as an offering some time after the duckling went home again without any one taking notice for two hundred years or more the duck and always the same duck has returned with her brood on a particular day to the church of st nicholas at montfort this history was written and printed in sixteen fifty two and its author very justly remarks that a poor insignificant wild duck is a thing of small consequence in the eyes of god and yet it contributes its portion of homage to his greatness that the grasshopper of st francis was still more contemptible and notwithstanding its chirping pleas the ear of a seraph but madame de chateaubriand followed a false tradition in her lamentation she represents the young lady as a princess who was permitted to become a wild duck in order to escape from the hands of her betrayer i only recollect the following lines of my mother's poem can la belle est devenue et s'envola par une guille dans un étang plein de lentilles End of chapter three chapter four of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter four paris october eighteen twenty one the priesthood the environs of st malo 
As Madame de Chateaubriand was a real saint, she got the Bishop of Saint-Malo to admit me into the priesthood. He had scruples about doing this, for it appeared to him a sort of profanation, nearly akin to simony, to bestow upon a layman and a militaire the mark of the ecclesiastical order. M. Courtois de Pressigny, who is now Archbishop of Besançon and a peer of France, is an honest and worthy man. He was then young, patronised by the Queen, and on the way to that distinction at which he more recently arrived by a better road, persecution. I kneeled down in my uniform and with my sword by my side at the feet of the prelate. He cut off a lock of hair from the crown of my head, this is called the tonsure, and of this fact I was furnished with letters in proper form. With these letters two hundred thousand livres de rente would devolve to me, when the proofs of my noblesse were admitted at Malta, an abuse without doubt in the ecclesiastical order, but very useful in the political order of the ancient constitution. Was it not better that a kind of military benefice should be attached to the sword of a soldier than to the mantle of an abbe, who would have consumed the revenues of his rich priory in the gaieties of Paris? My having the tonsure for the preceding reasons has caused some ill-informed biographers to state that at the commencement of my career I entered the church. This event took place in 1788. I kept horses and rode about the country, or galloped along beside the waves, my murmuring and ancient friends. I dismounted and played with them. The whole barking family of Scylla jumped on my knees to caress me. Nunc vada latrantis Scyllae. I have gone very far in order to admire the beauties of nature. I could have been content with those which my native country offered to my view. There can be nothing more beautiful than the environs of Saint-Malo in a circle of five or six leagues. The banks of the Rance, from its mouth to Dinan, are well worth the visit of the traveller, an ever-changing scene of rocks and verdure, of stream and forest, of creeks and hamlets, of the ancient manners of feudal Brittany, and the modern habitations of commercial Brittany. The latter were built at a time when the merchants of Saint-Malo were so rich that in their merry moods they used to make a fricassee of piastres, and throw them boiling hot out of the windows to the people. These houses are very magnificent. Bonabon, the chateau of the Messrs de la Sandre, is partly built with marble brought from Genoa, an instance of luxury of which we never even think in Paris. La Briante, Le Beau, Montmarin, La Balue, and Le Colombier are, or were, ornamented with orangeries, jet d'eau, and statues. Sometimes the gardens descend shelving to the shore. Behind the arcades of a portico of lime trees, through a colonnade of pines, at the extremity of a grass plot, Beyond the tulips of a parterre lies the sea, with its vessels, its calms, and its tempests. Every peasant, whether sailor or labourer, is the owner of a little white cottage with a garden. Amongst the pot-herbs, gooseberries, roses, iris, and marigolds of this garden may be found a young tea-tree from Cayenne, a plant of tobacco from Virginia, and a flower from China. Some souvenir, in short, from other shores and other skies. It is the itinerary and map of the master of the place. The dwellers on the coast are a fine Norman race, the women tall, graceful, and active, wearing corsets of grey wool, short petticoats of calamanco and striped silk, and white stockings with coloured clocks. Their faces are shaded by a large headdress of dimity or cambric, the flaps of which are either turned back or fly loose like a veil. A silver chain in several loops hangs at their left side. Every morning in spring these daughters of the north, descending from their boats as if they were coming again to invade the country, carry to the market quantities of fruit in baskets and of curds in shells, and whilst with one hand they steady on their heads black vases full of milk or flowers, the lappets of their white mob-caps, their blue eyes, rosy cheeks, and fair hair empearled with dew, present a picture not to be exceeded by the Canifor of Athens, or the Valkyries of the Edda, the youngest of whom is Lavinia. Is the original of this picture still to be seen? These women are, probably, no more. There is nothing left but my recollection of them. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, Part Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, Part Two, by François René de Chateaubriand. Chapter Five. Paris, October 1821. The Ghost, the Invalid. I took leave of my mother and went to see my older sisters in the vicinity of Fougeres. I stayed a month with Madame de Chateaubourg. Both her country houses, La Scarde and Le Plessis, were near saint aubin du cormier famous for its tower and its battle, and were situated in a country of rocks, heath, and wood. My sister employed as her manager, Monsieur Livoret, 
who had formerly been a Jesuit, and who had had a strange adventure. At the time of his being appointed to this situation, the elder Count Chateaubourg had just died. M. Livoret, who had never seen him, came to reside in the castle as keeper. The first night that he slept there, a pale old gentleman entered his apartment in a dressing-gown and nightcap, and carrying in his hand a small light. The apparition approached the hearth, placed his candlestick on the mantelpiece, lighted the fire, and sat down in an armchair. M. Livoret trembled all over. After sitting for two hours quite silent, the old man got up, took his candle, and left the room, shutting the door after him. The next day the manager related the circumstance to the farmers, and from the description of the spirit, they affirmed that it must have been their old master. But this is not all. If M. Livoret ever looked behind him in the forest, he was sure to see the phantom, and one day, having to go over a fence in one of the fields, he saw that the ghost had seated himself astride on the top of it. At last the persecuted man ventured on one occasion to say, Monsieur de Chateaubourg, let me alone, on which the ghost replied, No. Monsieur Livoret, who was a cool, positive man, with no imaginative faculty, used to relate this story whenever he was asked, and always in the same manner, and with the same conviction of its truth. Shortly after this time I went into Normandy, along with a brave officer who was attacked by brain fever. We were lodged in a peasant's cottage, where a piece of old tapestry lent by the owner of the estate was the only partition between my bed and that of the invalid. Behind this tapestry they bled the patient, and to ease his sufferings plunged him into an ice-bath, and there he shivered in that torturing remedy, with blue nails, pinched and discoloured face, his teeth closed, his head shaved, and his long pointed beard descending from his chin, and serving as a covering to his naked chest, so thin and wet. When the poor fellow wept, he would put up an umbrella, believing that it would shelter him from his tears. If the means had proved effectual, a statue should be erected to the author of the discovery. My only time of relaxation was when I went to take a walk in the churchyard of the hamlet, which was situated on a hillock. My companions were the dead, some birds, and the setting sun. There I used to think of my friends in Paris, of my early youth, of my phantom, and of those woods of Combourg, which I was so near as to space so far removed from by time. I would then go back again to my poor invalid. It was the blind leading the blind. Alas, a blow, a fall, some mental suffering, could deprive a Homer, a Newton, a Bossuet, of their genius, and those divine men, instead of receiving our profound pity, our mournful and eternal attention, might become the objects of a smile. Many persons whom I have known and loved have made themselves uneasy about me, as if I carried about me the seeds of this disease. I explained the chef d'oeuvre of Cervantes and his severe gaiety by this sad reflection, that in carefully contemplating life and weighing the good against the evil, one would be tempted to wish for any accident which might lead to oblivion, as a means of escaping from oneself. A merry drunkard is a happy creature. Putting religion out of the question, happiness consists in not knowing ourselves, and in arriving at death without having had the experience of life. I brought my fellow countrymen back, perfectly cured. End of chapter 5《ชั้นที่6ของเรื่องราวของชาติโอเบรียน1768-1800 Part 2》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768-1800, Part 2, by François-René de Chateaubriand, Chapter 6. Paris, October 1821. The States of Brittany in 1789. Insurrection. saint Rivel, my fellow student, is killed. Madame Lucille and Madame de Farcy, who had come with me into Brittany, wished to go back to Paris, but I was detained by the disturbances in the province. The States were summoned for the end of December, 1788. The Commune of Rennes, and after its example the other Communes of Brittany, had passed a resolution forbidding their deputies to enter on the discussion of any other question, before that of the hearth tax should be finally settled. The Comte de Boisgelin, President of the Order of Noblesse, hastened to Rennes. The gentlemen were convoked by private letters, and these included also those who, like myself, were yet too young to have a vote. As we might be attacked, we were obliged to take account of numbers as well as votes, so we went to our post. There were several meetings held at the house of Monsieur de Boisgelin before the opening of the States. The scenes of confusion which I had already witnessed were renewed. The Chevalier de Guerre, the Marquis de Tremaga, and my uncle, the Count de Bedet, who was called Artichoke Bedet because of his round figure, to distinguish him from another of the same name who was named Asparagus Bedet on account of his being tall and slender, broke several chairs by climbing on them in order to harangue. The Marquis de Tremaga 
an officer with a wooden leg created many enemies to his class one day they were talking about establishing a military school where the sons of the less wealthy noblesse might be educated and a member of the tier having cried out and where shall our sons go then to the hospital replied tremarca an expression which was caught up by the crowd and soon bore fruit during these meetings i became aware of a tendency in my character which has since been developed both in politics and in the service the warmer my colleague or comrades grow the cooler i grow i can see a tribune set on fire or a cannon discharged with indifference i have never either cheered or fired a salute the result of our deliberations was that the general state of affairs should be first considered and the question of the hearth tax not be brought forward until after the settlement of the other points a resolution directly opposed to that of the tiers the landowners had no great confidence in the clergy who often deserted them particularly when they had for their president the bishop of rennes a crafty circumspect man who spoke with a measured slowness not ungraceful and attended carefully to the state of things at court the sentinelle du peuple a journal conducted at rennes by a scribbler from paris increased the ill-will so generally felt the sittings of the states took place in the convent of the jacobins in the square of the palace in such a mood as i have described we entered the hall of the assembly and had scarcely arrived there when we were besieged by the mob the twenty fifth twenty sixth twenty seventh and twenty eighth of january seventeen eighty nine were unfortunate days the comte de thiers had but few troops a leader without either vigour or decision of character he moved about but did nothing the law school at rennes at the head of which was moreau had sent for the young men of nantes they arrived to the number of four hundred and notwithstanding the entreaties of their commanding officer they rushed into the town meetings were held at montmarin and in the cafes and as their opinions were quite opposed they came to bloody collisions tired of being blocked up in our hall we came to the determination of sallying out sword in hand and it was a very animated scene at a signal from our president we drew our swords all at once crying out vive la bretagne and like a garrison rendered desperate we made a furious sortie in order to bear down our besiegers the mob received us with yells showers of stones blows from loaded sticks and pistol shots we made a gap in the waving mass which again closed around us several gentlemen were wounded dragged about their clothes torn and covered with bruises and contusions at length after considerable difficulty we all regained our lodgings several duels took place afterwards between some of our party and the law students and their friends from nantes one of these duels was fought publicly in the place royale the honour of victory remained with an old officer of marine named coralia who fought with such vigour as to obtain the applause of his young adversaries another riot took place the Comte de Montboucher saw amongst the crowd a student named Ulysse, to whom he said, Monsieur, this concerns us. A circle was formed round them. Montboucher knocked the sword out of the student's hand, and then gave it back to him. They embraced each other, and the crowd dispersed. At all events, the Breton noblesse did not submit dishonourably. They refused to meet deputies to the States, because they had not been summoned according to the fundamental laws of the Constitution of Brittany. They went in great numbers to join the army of the princes, and were decimated in the army of Condé or with charette in the vendean wars would it have made any difference in the majorities of the national assembly if they had formed part of it that is hardly probable in great social transformations individual resistance though it may be honourable to those who offer it has little effect against the force of circumstances however it is impossible to say what might have happened had a man possessing the talents of mirabeau but of opposite opinions been found amongst the ranks of the noblesse of brittany young boishu and saint rubel my fellow-students had been killed before these duels on their way to the hall of the noblesse the former was vainly defended by his father who acted as his second reader i ask thee to pause look at the first drops of blood shed by the revolution it was ordained that they should flow from the veins of a companion of my childhood suppose that i had fallen instead of saint rubel what was said of this first victim in the great sacrifice might have been said of me merely changing the name a gentleman named chateaubriand was killed on his way to the hall of the states these few words would have taken the place of my long history would saint rivel have played my part in the world was he destined to noise or to silence pass on however reader cross over the river of blood which separates for ever the old world which thou leavest from the new world at the entrance to which thou shalt die End of chapter six Chapter seven of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two. This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. 
Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, by François René de Chateaubriand, Part Two, Chapter Seven. Paris, November 1821. The year 1789. Journey from Brittany to Paris. Commotion of the road. Aspect of Paris. Dismissal of Monsieur Necker. Versailles. Joy of the royal family. General insurrection. Taking of the Bastille. The year 1789, so famous in the history of France and of the human race, found me still on the plains of my native Brittany. I could not leave the province till late in the year, and did not reach Paris till after the pillage of the Maison Reveil, the opening of the States General, the constitution of the Tiers Etat in National Assembly, the oath of the Jeux de Paume, the Royal Council on the 23rd of June, and the junction of the clergy and nobility with the Tiers Etat. Along my road the movement among the people was great. In the villages peasants stopped carriages, demanded passports, and interrogated travellers. As I drew near the capital the agitation increased. Passing through Versailles I saw troops quartered in the orangery, trains of artillery lodged in the courts, the temporary hall of the National Assembly erected in the great square of the palace, and deputies going and coming through crowds of curious spectators, people belonging to the palace, and soldiers. In Paris the streets were blocked up by a crowd which kept guard at the baker's doors. Passers-by collected into knots at the corners of streets and discoursed. Tradesmen came out of their shops and stood at the doors, listening to and relating news. Agitators gathered together at the Palais Royal. Among these groups Camille Desmoulins was already distinguishing himself. I had scarcely alighted with Madame Farcy and Lucille at apartments in the Rue de Richelieu when an insurrection broke out. The people rushed to the abbe to liberate some guards who had been imprisoned by order of their officers. The sub-officers of an artillery regiment quartered in the Invalides joined the people. Defection in the army had begun. The court, now yielding, now attempting to resist, a strange mixture of obstinacy and weakness, bravado and fear, allowed itself to be browbeaten by Mirabeau, who came to demand the removal of the troops, yet did not consent to their removal. It submitted to the affront, yet did not destroy its cause. In Paris a report spread that an army was on its way from Montmartre, that dragoons were going to force the barriers. On this it was proposed to tear up the paving stones, carry them up to the housetops, and fling them down on the satellites of the tyrant. Every hand was instantly at work. In the midst of this confusion, M. Necker received orders to retire. The new ministry was composed of Messieurs de Breteuil, de la Galaisière, Marshal de Broglio, de la Vauguillon, de la Porte, and de Foulon. They were appointed in place of Messieurs de Montmorin, de la Luzerne, de Saint-Priest, et de Nivernay. A poet from Brittany, lately arrived, had begged me to go with him to Versailles. There are people who visit gardens and jet d'eau, amidst the convulsions of empires, the overthrow of thrones. Scribblers are especially possessed of the faculty of wrapping themselves up in their mania, while the most weighty events occur around them. Their phrase or their verse stands, instead of everything, to them. I took my pindar to the gallery of Versailles at the hour of mass. The Eau de Boeuf was radiant in the security of victory. The dismissal of M. Necker had raised the spirits of the court. Samson and Simon, perhaps, mingling in the crowd, looked on at the joys of the royal family. The queen passed, accompanied by her two children. Their fair silken locks seemed awaiting a crown. The Duchesse d'Angoulême, then eleven years old, attracted all eyes by the modest dignity of her mien. Beautiful in her exalted rank, and in her maiden innocence, she seemed to say, like the orange blossom in Corneille's Guillaume de Julie, J'ai la pompe de ma naissance. The little dauphin walked under the protection of his sister, and M. du Touché followed his pupil. This gentleman saw me, and obligingly pointed me out to the queen. She smiled and saluted me in the same gracious way as she had done on the day of my presentation. I shall never forget that glance, so soon to be extinguished in death. When she smiled, Marie Antoinette showed the form of her mouth so clearly that the remembrance of that smile, fearful idea, enabled me to recognize the jaw when the head of this unfortunate daughter of kings was discovered during the exhumations in 1815. The counter-blow to that struck at Versailles was felt at Paris. On my return I came in contact with a crowd bearing busts of Monsieur Necker and of the Duke of Orleans, covered with crape. They shouted, Vive Necker! Vive le Duc d'Orléans! And one cry arose, bolder and more unforeseen, Vive Louis XVII! The child whose very name would have been forgotten in the monumental inscription of his family, if I had not reminded the Chamber of Peers of his existence. Had Louis XVI abdicated, 
Louis de Sept, been placed on the throne, and the Duke of Orléans been made regent, what would have been the course of things? In the Place Louis XV, Prince Lombes, at the head of the Royal German Guard, drove back the people into the gardens of the Tuileries, and wounded an old man. Instantly the alarm bell rang out. The armourer's shops were broken into, and eighty thousand muskets taken from the Invalides. The people armed themselves with pikes, sticks, forks, sabres, and pistols, pillaged St. Lazarus, and burned the barriers. The electors of Paris took the government of the capital into their own hands, and in one night sixty thousand citizens were organised, armed, and equipped as national guards. On the 14th of July the Bastille was taken. I was present as a spectator at this attack upon a timid governor and a few invalids. If the gates had been kept shut, the people would never have succeeded in breaking into the fortress. I saw two or three cannon shots fired, not by the invalids, but by French guards, who had already ascended the towers. Delaunay, dragged from his dungeon, and subjected to a thousand outrages, was at length murdered on the steps of the Hôtel de Ville. Flessel, the prévôt des marchands, was shot through the head. Such were the sights delighted in by heartless, saintly hypocrites. In the midst of these murders the people abandoned themselves to orgies similar to those carried on during the troubles of Rome under Otho and Vitellius. The conquerors of the Bastille, heroes of the tavern, rode along in hired carriages in drunken happiness. Low women and sans culottes began to reign and form their escort. The passers-by uncovered their heads with the respect of fear to these heroes, some of whom died of fatigue in the midst of their triumph. Keys of the Bastille were multiplied and sent to all the simpletons of importance throughout the four quarters of the world. How many times I have just missed making my fortune! Had I, though only a spectator, inscribed my name that day on the roll of the conquerors, I should have a pension now. Crowds of expert people flocked to the autopsy of the Bastille. Temporary cafés were established under tents. People crowded thither as they were to the fairs at Saint-Germain and Longchamp. Numerous vehicles defiled by or stopped at the base of the towers, from the summits of which stones detached from the walls fell in whirlwinds of dust. Well-dressed women and fashionable young men, standing on different parts of the Gothic ruins, mingled with the half-naked workmen employed in demolishing the walls amidst the acclamations of the crowd. To this rendezvous came the most famous orators, the best-known men of letters, the most celebrated painters, the most renowned actors and actresses, the danseurs most in vogue, the most illustrious foreigners, the court nobility, and the ambassadors from all parts of Europe. Old France had come there to die, new France to begin its life. No event, however miserable and odious in itself, should be treated with levity when its circumstances are serious, when it forms an epoch. What should have been seen in the taking of the Bastille, and this was not then seen, was not the violent act of a people's emancipation, but that emancipation itself, the result of the act. Public admiration was given to the part of this event which deserved condemnation, that which it owed to chance, and no glance was cast into the future to seek the accomplished destinies of a people, the change of manners, ideas, and political powers, the renovation of the human race, of which the taking of the Bastille like a bloody jubilee opened the era. Brutal rage overthrew this edifice, but beneath this rage lay the intelligence which amidst the ruins established the foundations of a new fabric. But although a nation may deceive itself in its estimate of the greatness of the material fact, it does not deceive itself in that of the moral fact. In its eyes the Bastille was the trophy of its servitude. It seemed to stand at the entrance to Paris, opposite the sixteen pillars of Montfaucon, like the gibbet of its liberty. In raising a state fortress the people thought to break the military yoke, and tacitly bound themselves to replace the army which they were dispersing. We all know what prodigies were performed when the nation became one vast army. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, Part Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, Part Two, by François René de Chateaubriand. Chapter Eight. Paris, November 1821. Effect of the taking of the Bastille on the court. Heads of Foulon and Berthier. Aroused by the noise of the Bastille's fall, forerunner, as it were, announcing the approaching fall of the throne, the court of Versailles had passed from boasting to despondency. The king hastened to the National Assembly, even spoke from the President's chair, announced that orders had been given for the removal of the troops, and returned to his palace amidst the benedictions of the people. Useless parade. No party believes in the conversion of its opponent. 
liberty capitulating or power submitting to concession obtained no mercy from their enemies eighty deputies left versailles to announce peace to the capital illuminations glittered in its streets m bailly was appointed mayor of paris and m de lafayette commandant of the national guard i only knew this poor but respectable savant by his misfortunes revolutions have men for all their periods some follow their track to the end others begin them but do not aid in crowning them the courtiers were scattered in all directions in the general confusion of flight they went to Bâle, Lausanne, Luxembourg, and Brussels. Madame de Polignac, in her flight, met M. Necker returning. The Count d'Artois, his sons, and the three Condés emigrated. With them went the higher clergy and part of the nobility. The officers, threatened by the insurgent soldiers, yielded to the torrent and left the country. Louis the Sixteenth stood alone before the nation with his two children and a few women, the Queen, Mesdames, and Madame Elizabeth. Monsieur, who remained in Paris until the flight to Varennes, was of no great use to his brother although by giving his vote in the national assembly in favour of universal suffrage he might have given the preponderance to the revolution the revolution distrusted him he had no great liking for the king did not understand the queen and was not loved by them louis the sixteenth came to the hotel de ville on the seventeenth and was received there by a hundred thousand men armed like the monks of the league he was there harangued by messieurs bailly moreau de saint Méry, and lally tollendal who wept the latter has always been easily moved to tears the king was affected in his turn and fixed an enormous tricoloured cockade in his hat he was instantly declared honnête homme père des français roi d'un peuple libre which people was preparing in virtue of its liberty to cut off the head of this worthy man its father and its king a few days after this accommodation i was standing at the window of my apartments with my sisters and a few countrymen when we heard the cry shut the doors shut the doors a ragged group appeared at one end of the street bearing two standards which at that distance we could not well distinguish as they came nearer we saw that they were two heads with hair dishevelled and countenances distorted borne on pikes by these forerunners of marat they were the heads of messieurs foulon and berthier every one retired from the window except myself the assassins stopped when they saw me and held up the pikes singing capering and leaping up to bring the pale heads as near me as possible in one of them an eye had fallen from its socket and hung on the livid cheek the pike was fastened into the open mouth whose teeth bit the iron murderers cried i unable to contain my indignation is it thus you understand liberty if i had had a gun i would have fired on these wretches as i would on wolves they replied with howls and beat violently on the great gate with the intention of breaking in and adding my head to the others my sisters were much alarmed the cowardly proprietors of the house overwhelmed me with reproaches the murderers who were being pursued had not time to break into the house and moved off the sight of these heads and of others which soon after greeted my eyes changed my political dispositions a horror of these cannibal festivals seized me and the idea of quitting france for some distant land began to gain strength in my mind End of chapter eight chapter nine of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty-eight to eighteen hundred, part two, by François René de Chateaubriand, chapter nine. Paris, November eighteen twenty-one. Recall of Monsieur Necker, sitting of the fourth of August seventeen eighty-nine, the fifth of October, the King brought to Paris. Monsieur Necker, the third successor of Turgot, Calonne, and Tabouret were the two preceding, was recalled to the ministry on the twenty-fifth of July inaugurated and received with fetes in his honour but the events of the time soon left him in the rear and he became unpopular it was one of the singularities of the time that such a grave personage should have been raised to the ministry by the savoir faire of a man of such ordinary talent and so frivolous as the marquis de pezé the comte rondieu which substituted the system of loans for that of taxation in france gave an impetus to ideas on this subject even women discussed expenses and receipts for the first time people saw or thought they saw something in the financial ciphering machine these calculations painted of a colour a la thomas had first established the reputation of the director-general of finance an able treasurer but an economist poor in expedients a noble but inflated author a worthy man but without any high degree of virtue the banker was one of those old-fashioned personages who came before the curtain to explain the piece to the public and disappeared when it rose m necker was the father of madame de steel but his vanity hardly permitted him to imagine that his true claim to the remembrance of posterity 
would lie in the fame of his daughter the monarchy was demolished as rapidly as the bastille in the sitting of the national assembly on the evening of the fourth of august those in the present day who influenced by hatred of the past cry out against the nobility forget that it was a member of this nobility viscount noailles aided by the duc d'aiguillon and mathieu de montmorency who overthrew the edifice which was the object of revolutionary ill-will on the motion of the feudal deputy feudal rights the rights of the chase of the pigeon-house and warren tithes and field rents privileges of orders towns and provinces personal servitude seigneurial jurisdiction and venality of office were abolished the heaviest blow struck at the old constitution came from the hands of men of rank the patricians began the revolution the plebeians finished it and as old france owed its glory to its nobility so does young france owe its liberty if liberty there be for france the troops encamped in the environs of paris had been removed yet by one of those contradictory counsels to the opposite winds of which the king's will bent like a reed the flanders regiment was summoned to versailles the body-guards gave a banquet to the officers of this regiment the wine had its influence the queen made her appearance with the dauphin in the midst of the festivity the health of the royal family was given then came the king the band played the touching and favourite air o richard o mon roi the news of this banquet soon reached paris the revolutionists immediately took it up crying out that louis refused his sanction to the declaration of rights with the intention of escaping to metz with count d'estaing marat encouraged and spread the rumour he was already writing l'ami du peuple the fifth of october arrived i was not a witness of the events of that day but early on the sixth full accounts of it reached the capital a visit from the king was announced at the same time though timid in a saloon i was bold in public i felt myself made for solitude or the forum i hastened to the champs elysees first came the cannon on which every variety of disreputable women seated astride talked and gesticulated with disgusting indecency then amidst a multitude of every age and sex marched the king's bodyguard who had exchanged hats swords and belts with the national guard they were on foot and behind came their horses on each of which were mounted two or three fishwomen dirty and drunken bacchanals then came the deputation of the national assembly then the king's carriages seen through the dusty haze of a forest of pikes and bayonets rag-pickers all in tatters butchers with bloody aprons and naked knives at their belts walked beside the carriage doors other black satyrs had climbed to the top others hung on to the footman's steps to the coach-box musket and pistol-shots were fired and the mob cried here are the baker the baker's wife and the little baker's boy two guards heads dressed and powdered by a hairdresser of sevres were borne aloft on swiss halberts before the son of st louis in place of a royal ensign the astronomer bailly declared to the king in the hotel de ville that the people humane respectful and faithful had just conquered their king and the king on his side much touched and satisfied declared that he had come to paris of his own free will unworthy falsehoods of violence and of fear which at that time disgraced all parties and individuals louis the sixteenth was not false he was weak weakness is not falseness but it stands in its stead and fulfils its functions the respect which should be inspired by the virtues and misfortunes of the saintly and martyred king renders any human judgment upon him almost sacrilegious constituent assembly the deputies quitted versailles and held their first sitting on the nineteenth of october in one of the large rooms of the archbishop's palace on the ninth of november they removed to the riding-house near the tuileries the remainder of the year seventeen eighty nine witnessed the successive decrees which despoiled the clergy destroyed the old magistracy and created the assignats the resolution of the commune of paris to appoint the first committee of inquiry and the order of the judges for the prosecution of the marquis de favre the constituent assembly notwithstanding all that may have been said against it nevertheless must continue to be regarded as the most illustrious popular assembly which ever appeared among nations both on account of the magnitude of its designs and the vast importance of their results there was no great political question which was not brought under its consideration and suitably resolved what would have been the case if it had continued itself to the resolution of the states-general and had not gone beyond all that experience in human knowledge had conceived discovered and elaborated for three centuries are to be found in the minutes of its proceedings the various abuses of the old monarchy are there pointed out and their remedies proposed all the principles of liberty are asserted even the freedom of the press all the necessary ameliorations are demanded for industry manufactures trade highways the army taxation finance colleges public education etc we have traversed without advantage the abysses of crime and the heights of glory the republic and the empire have promoted no advance the empire has only wielded the brute force of the arms which the republic set in motion it has left us the principle of centralization 
a species of vigorous administration which i regard as an evil but which alone perhaps was sufficient to replace local administrations when they were destroyed and anarchy and ignorance everywhere ruled supreme since the time of the constituent assembly we have not advanced a single step its labours are like those of the great physician of antiquity which at once marked out and fixed the limits of science we will now refer to some of the members of that assembly and first of all fix our attention on mirabeau who may be regarded as the pre-eminent illustration of them all End of chapter nine chapter ten of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter ten paris november eighteen twenty one mirabeau by the irregularities and accidents of his life mirabeau was mixed up with the greatest events and brought into contact with convicts ravishers and adventurers mirabeau the tribune of the aristocracy the representative of the democracy combined in his character gracchus and don juan catiline and guzman d'alfarache cardinal richelieu and cardinal de retz the roue of the regency and the terrorist of the revolution moreover mirabeau possessed the character of his family florentine exiles who retained their armed palaces and were conspicuous as specimens of those leaders of faction celebrated by dante his ancestors were naturalized in france where the republican spirit of the italians of the middle ages and the feudal spirit of the middle ages in france were found united in a succession of extraordinary men the ugliness of mirabeau engrafted upon the element of beauty peculiar to his race produced a species of striking figure such as those in the last judgment of michelangelo the fellow-countryman of the Arighetti the deep furrows left by the smallpox on the orator's face were like scars left by fire nature seemed to have moulded his head either for dominion or the gallows fashioned his arms either to hold down a nation or to carry off a woman when he shook his locks and looked at the people he subdued them to his will when he raised his fist and showed them his nails the multitude became furious in the midst of the most frightful disorders of a sitting i have seen him at the tribune dark ugly and motionless he recalled to mind Milton's chaos, impassable and without form, in the centre of confusion. Mirabeau resembled his father and his uncle, who, like Saint-Simon, wrote immortal pages in honour of the devil. These furnished him with speeches for the tribune. He took from them whatever his mind could amalgamate with his own substance. Whenever he adopted them as a whole, he delivered them boldly. It was obvious they were not his own from occasional words which were mixed up with them, and which revealed himself. His energy was the offspring of his vices and these vices were not the children of a frigid temperament but of passions deep burning and tempestuous cynicism of manners by the annihilation of the moral sense introduces a kind of barbarism into society these barbarians of society are men fitted to destroy like the goths but destitute of their power of reconstruction the latter were enormous children of a virgin nature the former monstrous abortions of a depraved one i have twice met mirabeau at a banquet once at the marquise de villette's voltaire's niece and a second time at the palais royal with the deputies of the opposition to whom i was introduced by chapelier chapelier was drawn to the scaffold in the same wagon with my brother and m de malzerbe mirabeau talked a great deal and especially a great deal about himself this son of lions and himself a lion with the head of the chimera this man so positive in his facts was all romance all enthusiasm in imagination and language in him might be seen the lover of sophie exalted in his sentiments and capable of sacrifices i have found her said he that adorable woman i knew her soul a soul formed by the hands of nature in a moment of magnificence mirabeau enchanted me with his tales of love with his recollections of that retreat where he passed his time in dry discussions he interested me still more by his accounts of another passage in his life like myself he had been harshly treated by his father who like mine had preserved the inflexible traditions of absolute paternal authority the great guest spoke profusely on foreign politics but said almost nothing of home affairs which nevertheless completely occupied his mind occasional expressions escaped him which showed his sovereign contempt for men who made pretensions to superiority by the indifference which they affected towards evils and crimes mirabeau was by nature generous sensible to friendship and ready to pardon offences notwithstanding his immorality he was unable to repress the workings of his conscience it was only dead for himself his upright and firm mind never regarded murder as a sublimity of intelligence 
he felt no admiration whatever for the slaughter-houses and lay stalls mirabeau however was not deficient in pride he boasted enormously and though he became a draper in order to be elected by the tiers the nobility having had the honourable folly to reject him he was very proud of his birth his father called him a wild bird whose nest was among four turrets he never forgot that he had appeared at court ridden in one of the king's carriages and accompanied him to the hunt he required to be addressed by the title of count he stuck to his colours and loaded his servants with livery when every one else gave it up in season and out of season he always quoted his relation the admiral de coligny the monitor having called him riquet do you know said he with warmth to the journalist that with your riquet you have confounded europe for three days he was accustomed to repeat the following impudent and well-known pleasantry in another family my brother the viscount would be the man of genius and the vagabond in my family he is the fool and the good man biographers attribute this saying to the viscount when comparing himself with humility to the other members of his family in the main mirabeau's feelings were monarchical as may be seen from the following beautiful expressions i was anxious to cure the french of the superstition of monarchy and to replace it by its worship in a letter intended to be brought under the notice of louis the sixteenth he wrote i had no desire to have laboured merely for a vast destruction that however was what took place heaven in order to punish us for our unemployed talents has sent us repentance for our success mirabeau moved opinions by two levers on the one hand he made the masses his fulcrum of whom whilst despising them he had constituted himself the defender on the other although a traitor to his order he retained its sympathy by other affinities of caste and common interests this never could have happened to a plebeian who might have become the champion of the privileged classes such an one would have been abandoned by his own party without gaining the aristocracy which is in its very nature ungrateful and inaccessible to all not born within its ranks the aristocracy moreover cannot improvise a noble because nobility is the daughter of time mirabeau founded a school by freeing themselves from the bonds of morality the men of this school imagined that they became statesmen these imitations have never produced anything better than perverse dwarfs he who flatters himself at being corrupt and a robber is merely a debauchee and a knave he who believes himself virtuous is only vile he who boasts of being criminal is only infamous too soon for himself and too late for it mirabeau sold himself to the court and the court bought him he staked his reputation against a pension and an embassy cromwell was on the brink of bartering his future fame for a title and the order of the garter in spite of his haughtiness mirabeau did not value himself high enough now that abundance of money and places has raised the price of consciences there is not a political tumbler who does not cost hundreds of thousands of francs and the highest honours of the state the tomb released mirabeau from his promises and sheltered him from dangers which probably he would not have been able to overcome his life showed his weakness for good his death has left him in possession of his power for evil going away from dinner there arose some discussion about mirabeau's enemies i was by his side and had not spoken a word he looked in my face with his eyes of pride genius and vice and placing his hand upon my shoulder said they will never pardon me for my superiority i still feel the impression of that hand as if satan had touched me with his claw of fire when mirabeau fixed his eye on the young mute had he a presentiment of my future productions did he think that he would one day be summoned back to my recollection i was destined to become the historian of high personages they have filed before me without my having attached myself to their cloaks so as to be drawn along with them to posterity mirabeau has already undergone that metamorphosis which takes place amongst those whose memories must live carried from the pantheon to the common sewer and from the sewer back to the pantheon he has been elevated to the very pinnacle of the time which now serves as his pedestal the real mirabeau is no longer to be seen but mirabeau idealized such as artists draw him in order to render him the symbol or myth of the period which he represents in this way he becomes both more true and more false out of so many reputations actors events and ruins only three men remain one belonging to each of the three great revolutionary periods mirabeau to the aristocracy robespierre to the democracy and bonaparte to despotism monarchy has none france has paid dear for these three reputations which virtue cannot acknowledge End of chapter 10chapter eleven of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nicole lee 
Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, Part Two, by François René de Chateaubriand, Chapter Eleven. Paris, December 1821. Sitting of the National Assembly. Robespierre. The sittings of the National Assembly excited an interest to which those of our chambers are far from approaching. It was necessary to rise early to find a place in the crowded tribunes. The deputies arrived, eating, talking, and gesticulating. They formed groups in the different parts of the hall, according to their opinions. There was the reading of the minutes, after that the development of the question fixed for discussion, or some extraordinary motion. The discussions did not turn upon an insipid clause of a law, and the order of the day scarcely ever was without a destruction. Members spoke for or against. Every one delivered his opinion, well or ill. The debates grew stormy, the galleries took part in the discussion, applauded, cheered, or hissed and hooted the speakers. The president rang his little bell. The deputies addressed one another from bench to bench. Mirabeau the younger seized his competitor by the collar. Mirabeau the elder shouted, Silence aux trente voix. One day I was sitting behind the royalist opposition, and before me there was a gentleman from Dauphiny, of a dark countenance and diminutive figure, who leapt in fury upon his seat, and said to his friends, Let us fall, sword in hand, upon those beggars there, pointing to the side of the majority. The dames of the hall, knitting in the tribunes, heard him, rose, and shouted all at once with their stockings in their hands and foaming mouths, À la lanterne! Viscount Mirabeau, Lautrec, and some other young nobles were eager to make an attack upon the tribunes. This fracas was soon stifled by another. Petitioners, armed with pikes, presented themselves at the bar. The people are perishing from hunger, said they. It is time to adopt measures against the aristocrats, and to rise to the height of circumstances. The President assured these citizens of his respect in the following terms. An eye is constantly kept on the traitors, and the assembly will do justice. Thereupon arose a new tumult. The deputies of the right shouted that everything was going into a state of anarchy. The deputies of the left replied that the people were to express their wishes, that they had a right to complain of the despotism, seated even in the bosom of the national representation. Thus they designated their colleagues to the sovereign people, which re-echoed the denunciation. The evening sittings far exceeded in scandalous excesses those of the morning. People speak better and more boldly by the light of lamps. The hall of the riding-house, then, became truly a theatre in which one of the greatest dramas of the world was being acted. The leading personages still belonged to the ancient order of things. Their terrible antagonists, concealed behind them, said little or nothing. Towards the close of a discussion I saw ascending the tribune, a deputy of a very ordinary appearance, dull and inanimate figure, with his hair regularly arranged and appropriately dressed, like the steward of a good mansion or a village notary, attentive to his personal appearance. He made a long and tedious report, to which no one listened. I asked his name. It was Robespierre. The people with shoes were ready to go out of the halls, and the sabots were already kicking the door. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768-1800, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768-1800, Part 2, by François René de Chateaubriand. Chapter 12. Paris, December 1821. Society, Aspect of Paris. Before the Revolution, whenever I read the history of public disturbances, I could not conceive how persons had been able to live in those times. I was astonished that Montaigne wrote in a chateau of which he could not make the circuit without the risk of being carried off by bands of leaguers or of Protestants. The Revolution has enabled me fully to understand the possibility of such an existence. Moments of crisis produce an increase of life among men. In a society which is going through the process of dissolution and reconstruction, the struggle of the two geniuses, the shock between the past and the future, the mixture of the old and the new manners, form a transitory combination which leaves not a moment of ennui. Passions and characters set at liberty exhibit a vigour which never appears in a well-regulated city. The infraction of laws, freedom from duties, usages and civility, even dangers, add interest to the disorder. The whole people in the universal respite of occupation walk in the streets, freed from its demagogues, relapse for a moment into a state of nature, and only begin to feel the necessity of the social reign when it is forced to bear the yoke of new tyrants called into existence by license. 
I could not more fully describe the society of 1789 and 1790 than by comparing it to the architecture of the time of Louis XII and of Francis I, when Grecian orders began to be mixed with the Gothic style, or rather by comparing it to a collection of the ruins and tombs of all ages heaped together pell-mell after the reign of terror in the cloisters of the Petit Augustin. Only the wrecks of which I speak were living and varied without intermission. In every corner of Paris there were literary réunions, political societies and theatres. The men of great future renown wandered about in the crowd without being known, like souls on the banks of Lethe, before having enjoyed the light. I have seen Marshal Gouvion Saint-Cyr play a character at the Théâtre du Marais in De Beaumarchais Mer Coupable, and one went from the club of the Fouillons to that of the Jacobins, from balls and gambling-houses to the gatherings of the Palais Royal, from the tribunes of the National Assembly to open-air meetings. Deputations of the people, pickets of cavalry, and patrols of infantry passed and repassed each other in the streets. Close beside a man in a French dress, with powdered hair, a sword at his side, his hat under his arm, pumps and silk stockings, there walked a man with cropped hair without powder, an English frock-coat, and an American cravat. The news was published by the actors at the theatre, and the pit resounded with patriotic songs. Occasional pieces attracted multitudes. An abbe appeared on the stage, the people shouted at him, Coxcomb, Coxcomb, and the abbe replied, Gentlemen, vive la nation. Mandini and his wife, Viganoni and Rovedino, might be heard at the Opera Buffa. After having listened to the howling of Sa Ira, one might have gone to admire Madame de Gazon, Madame Saint-Aubin, Caroline, the little Olivier, Mademoiselle Conta, Mollet, Fleury, and Talma, just then a debutant, after having seen Favre hanged. The promenades on the Boulevard du Temple and des Italiens, surnamed Coblenz, were crowded with showy women, among whom three young daughters of Gretry were conspicuous, white and red as their attire. The whole three soon died. She fell asleep for ever, says Gretry, speaking of his eldest daughter, seated upon my knee, and as beautiful as when alive. A multitude of carriages rolled over the crossings or bedaubed the sans culotte, and there was to be seen the beautiful Madame de Buffon sitting alone in the Duke of Orleans' phaeton at the door of some club. The elegance and taste of the aristocratic society was to be met with at the Hôtel de la Rochefoucauld, at the evening parties of Mesdames de Poix, de Nains, de Semillan, de Vaudreuil, and in some of the drawing-rooms of the high magistracy still remaining open. At the houses of Monsieur Necker, the Comte Montmorin, and the various public functionaries, were to be seen, with Madame de Steele, la Duchesse d'Aguillon, Madame de Beaumont, and de Serilly, all the new ornaments of France, and all the freedom of the new manners. The shoemaker, in the uniform of an officer of the National Guard, on his knees, took the measure of your foot. The monk, who on Fridays wore his white or black robe, on Sundays wore a round hat, dressed like a citizen. The shaven capuchin read the newspapers in the wine-shop or the tea-garden, and in the midst of a circle of frivolous women there appeared a grave nun. This was some aunt or sister turned out of her convent. Crowds visited the convents open to everybody, just as travellers in Granada run through the deserted halls of the Alhambra, or as they stop at Thibault, under the columns of the Temple of the Sibyl. Finally there were duels and amours, friendships in prison, and political brotherhood, mysterious rendezvous, under the clear sky, in the midst of the peace and poetry of nature, there were retired, silent, solitary walks, mixed with eternal oaths and unspeakable affections, in the midst of the hollow noise of a vanishing world, and the distant sound of a crumbling society, which threatened with its fall the destruction of all those sources of happiness placed at the feet of events. Whenever anything was lost sight of for four-and-twenty hours, no one could be sure of ever finding it again. Some engaged in revolutionary turmoils, others thought of civil war. Others again set out for Ohio whither they sent before them plans or chateaux to be built among Indian savages. Others, again, went to join the princes, all this cheerfully, often without a single sou in their pockets, the royalists alleging that the whole would end some morning by a decree of the Parliament, the patriots equally vain in their hopes, announcing the reign of peace and happiness with that of liberty. The following song was heard everywhere. La Sainte Chandelle d'Arras, Le Flambeau de la Provence, Si ne nous éclaire pas, Mettre le feu dans la France. On ne peut pas les toucher, mais on espère les moucher. And mark what opinions were formed of Robespierre and Mirabeau. It is as little in the power of any earthly faculties, said L'Etoile, to prevent the French people from speaking, as it is to bury the sun in the earth, 
or to shut it up in a hole the palace of the tuileries a great jail filled with convicts rose in the midst of these fetes of destruction those also sentenced to death enjoyed themselves whilst they were waiting for the cart the shearing time or the bloody shirt which had been put out to dry and they could see through the windows of their prison the dazzling illuminations of the queen's circle pamphlets and newspapers multiplied by thousands satires poems and the songs of the acts of the apostles replied to the ami du peuple or to the moderateur of the monarchical club edited by fontaine maillet dupin in the political articles of the mercure was in opposition to la penchamfort in the literary portion of the same paper champonettes the marquis de bonnet rivarol mirabeau the younger the holbein of the sword who levied the legion of hussars de la mort on the rhine and honore mirabeau the elder amused themselves while dining together by drawing caricatures and getting up the petit almanac des grands hommes after which honore went to propose martial law or the seizure of the possessions of the clergy he passed the night at the house of madame j after declaring that he would not quit the national assembly till driven thence at the bayonet point egalite consulted the devil in the lists of montrouge and returned to the garden at monceau to preside at orgies instituted by laclos the future regicide was worthy of his race exhausting his powers by debauchery before giving himself up to ambition lausin already sated and withered supped in his little house at the barrier du main with some opera dancers whose favours were divided between messieurs de noailles de dion de choiseul de nabon de talleyrand and some other exquisites of the day two or three mummies of whom are still in existence most of the courtiers celebrated for their immorality in the latter part of louis the fifteenth's reign and during that of louis the sixteenth were enrolled under the tricolor they had almost all been engaged in the american war and had bedaubed their cordon with republican colours the revolution employed them before it had risen to any great height they even became the principal generals in its army the duc de lausanne the romantic lover of the princess chartoriska the pursuer of women the loveless who in the modest jargon of the court had now this lady now that the duc de lausanne then duc de biron commanding for the convention in la vendee what a pity to see baron de besenval the false and cynical revealer of the corruptions of high life displaying all the puerilities of the old expiring monarchy this heavy baron compromised in the affair of the bastille and saved by m necker and mirabeau solely because he was a swiss what a misery what had such men to do with such events when the revolution increased in strength and power it contemptuously abandoned these frivolous apostates from the throne it had had need of their vices it had need of their heads it despised no blood not even that of madame du barry End of chapter 12